Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Good morning, it's 11 o'clock. I'm Thomas Bowles, I'm the Ag Agent here in Prince William County and welcome to uh, this week's class on small native trees and shrubs for the suburban landscape. Our presenter is Nancy Berlin, our Natural Resources Specialist. Nancy's gonna take it away here. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box. Welcome, it's good to see you all here this morning and I'm glad you could join us for our Wednesday 11 o'clock seminar. Um, this presentation will be posted on our YouTube channel. I'll give you the link later on, but you can just put in your Google search term, VCE Prince William. You can find a lot of presentations there on a lot of different topics that we've been adding over the summer. I'm gonna be using Latin and common names today. Uh, co common names can be confusing. And if you're gonna choose a plant at a garden center and you have um, knowledgeable people there, that's the best to use. Uh, you, because you wanna end up with the plant that you think you're getting. Some, and, and sometimes you can get a cultivar that's a little bit different, um, that's a little bit genetically different. I'm grateful for you tuning in. This presentation was uh, put together um, with the help of Linda Golden, Master Gardener Volunteer, who will be teaching another one of these seminars soon. So let's get started. So the reason why small trees and shrubs are important uh, is pictured in this photograph here. Uh, a lot of people in suburban lots uh, have a smaller lot and they put something in that they think is gonna be um, lovely and um, appropriate <clears throat> and it soon eats the house up. And or if somebody is going to be um, cutting it back, it takes a lot of work to keep it contained. So this is obviously the not right, the not the right plant for this place. So you're going to consider your lot size, the mature size of the plant that you're putting in, how much maintenance you're willing to do, and the more maintenance a plant needs, the more stress that it often will receive because you know if it's not in the right place it's it's probably and it needs a lot of maintenance then then those those pruning cuts can uh, introduce disease pretty easily you might want a variety of uh, small trees and shrubs and and certainly we're going to provide you with um, some native trees and shrubs that will are really wide variety but by no means exhaustive tree and shrub provides the bones of a landscape provides texture, structure, and color to your, to your landscape. In the, in the wintertime, uh, a tree form can really add um, architectural interest even during those winter months. And it, it, most important to me is the ecosystem services that a native tree or shrub provides. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I'm going to define small. That depends on the person that you're talking to. The small trees that we're gonna be considering are under 30 feet. We see, I see an awful lot of sycamores, which are beautiful native trees in uh, parking lots or in the middle of a front yard. Um, and, and they're really, they really want a lot more room than that. So that's, we're trying to help you to pick more appropriate long lived native uh, plants that you can use in your landscape that won't just take over the whole yard and will be healthy because they're in the right place. So uh, small trees, again, under 30 feet, except with one exception, I'll show you. Um, many of them are understory, so they have some shade tolerance if you already have a canopy of larger trees. And, but some, can, some herbaceous plants can be, they act like shrubs. We call them sub shrubs. I actually didn't know that term until fairly recently. Uh, but this is an example right here of Amazonia. That's the one in the front, the blue. And um, <clears throat> there are a couple different varieties, um, cultivars, and it tends to be kind of woody. Has beautiful spring blue flowers, nice green foliage right now, and in the fall it develops a, a, a beautiful yellow hue, and it acts like a shrub, except for I can cut it back every year to the ground, which you can do with some shrubs. Thomas Rainier, um, and I chatted this week over email, and um, he uses it, he's a landscape designer. You can uh, look him up under the Phyto Lab. And in the background, you see Nepeta, and that's less woody, less robust, but it, it's kind of acting like a shrub here too. 
but we're mostly going to be dealing, we're going to be dealing with woody plants. This is another Amsonia. This is the straight species, and you can see how it's kind of shrub-like. So you, you got to think about, you know, what you want, what the effect you want, and the maintenance in the place. Baptisia australis, or wild blue indigo, is, can also be considered a sub-shrub. It's a sturdy plant nitrogen fixer because it's in that pea family. This is a picture from Mount Cuba, Delaware, a public garden. It is a gorgeous plant and it, it acts, it's slow growing and it's somewhat woody looking. So choosing the right plant for the right place. So take some time and really look at the site where you want to put a shrub or tree and what's the exposure. You know, take, take a look at how sunny or shady Windy there, is it at the top of a slope? Is it on the middle of a slope? Is there a microclimate where is it hotter in that particular area? Is it lower uh, and maybe stays wet? What's the soil quality? Is the soil compacted? So really do your homework first before uh, selecting. And then what's your goal? Do you want spring color? Do you want four seasons of interest? My goal in my yard is to provide enough flowering fruiting shrubs so that I don't have to put out any bird feeders. And I'm, I'm slowly working up to that, um, that goal. Consider what the surrounding plants are. Are there allelopathic problems, which means are there chemicals that one plant sends out that will keep other plants from growing nearby? A, a walnut, we think, does that. And uh, I just found out that goldenrod, that uh, Solidago canadensis, does that, keeps other plants from growing by it. What's the plant community and how will this new plant fit in? Can you wait for a slow grower? Are you patient enough? Most plants that grow really, really fast, you might regret putting in. I'm not saying that's across the board, but uh, consider um, being patient. Have you got deer? This uh, gentleman, Dan, sculpted the shrubs to look like hunters, and I'm not advising this uh, because that's pretty severe pruning. Um, but these two sites, the Rutgers site, and if you don't get this uh, link right off the bat, all you have to do is Google deer resistant Rutgers in your Google search term, or, and maybe put an EDU on the end. Or the Plant Nova Natives has a really nice plant finder that you can utilize. In general, to find a reputable website, I would suggest you use your search terms and you add .edu or .ext at the end of your search terms to find an extension site or a, a research-based information because there's a lot of bad information out there and we want you to get the best. So why, why even consider a native tree or shrub? Because they're generally adapted to the conditions that we have and that makes them easier to grow or maintain if you pick the right spot. The right tree, whether native or not, or shrub, boosts your property values. It provides shade and year-round beauty and that certainly goes for non-natives too. Uh, trees cool the environment and they soak up greenhouse gases. You probably wouldn't be here if you didn't know all this stuff already. Native Virginia trees support an astonishing amount of Virginia native insects and wildlife and birds. And particularly we're getting tuned into how many caterpillars certain trees attract. And we used to think, oh, caterpillars, we'll kill all the caterpillars. But then you don't have any of the butterflies. And now we know that you don't have as many of the baby songbirds because it takes an astonishing amount of caterpillars to feed a family of baby songbirds. Northern Virginia natives are marked with an asterisk, a double asterisk at the end, and the rest are native to the East Coast or Virginia. The ones with the double asterisk are on the Plant Nova native site. You can read more about them. I've just put a few details on each slide. So a native versus a native are. If you attended any of our other classes, we've talked about this before, but native plants have been hybridized to enhance a certain feature, maybe the flower color or the leaf color or the shape or the size, and they may not be as attractive to wildlife. You can read more about native ours on the Mount Cuba Center website, just Google that, and they have a lot of great research there. A native ar may be, or a cultivar may be um, fertile, not, and it may be non-fertile. You're limiting the genetic diversity when you pick something that's been modified genetically. We'll take a small clarifying break here. When Nancy said genetically modified, she wasn't referring to genetically modified organisms or GMOs as they're known. She was referring 
to plants that had been modified through breeding. Hybrid varieties, whether they are cultivars or nativars, are bred. So you have sexual variation, mixing of DNA, but it's DNA from that same plant. GMO varieties are where they take DNA strands from other organisms and they add them into the plant. There are very few GMO plants that are allowed to be grown in the United States. So we're talking about hybrids, not GMOs. Now back to our regularly scheduled program. There are some really great native ours. They're slightly different than the native plant that are still quite beneficial. And again, Mount Cuba has done some great research with Doug telling me on that topic. I could show you a lot of beautiful pictures of shrubs and trees, but I really want you to know that most trees and shrubs are not planted right. We get a lot of calls from our Extension Horticulture help desk and, and emails and what's wrong with my tree and shrub and it was fine and it's only five years old. Well, these cultural con considerations are the most important. So I'm going to cover these first because your money is wasted if you pick the right plant for the right place, but it's not taken care of or planted correctly. So we're going to cover this first and it'll be worth it. So choosing a tree at a nursery, um, you're going to look for a tree that looks healthy and has a single trunk or leader. Now there are multi-stem shrubs, so th this only goes for trees with a single leader. And you should be able to see that trunk flare at the bottom uh, above the pot. And I'm going to tell you, it's very rare to see it with a potted plant or even a bald and burlap. <clears throat> so you may have to do some repair work on that. It doesn't have enough healthy roots to support growth, and that might mean asking for help to take a look at the roots in the pot, if you can get it out of the pot. Uh, the trunk is free of mechanical wounds and pruning mistakes, um, stubs left, bad pruning cuts, any weed whacker damage, a, a place where the plant has been grafted that may not be, um, may have a wound on it. Um, you're looking for a strong form, well-spaced and firmly attached branches. And look at the leaf color. So this is what you avoid, undersized leaves, insect damage. If, it, if it's a tree that's a, a single trunk kind of tree, it should have, have one main leader. Are there weeds in the pot? Any tree in a pot is probably going to have some circling roots and you can do repair work on that after that I'll show you. This is your first step, being a good consumer and picking a, a high quality tree or shrub. Again, remember that some trees and shrubs are naturally multi-stemmed. Like this is a spice bush picture. Red tree dogwoods and some of the, a lot of the viburnums and the chokeberry and some of the holly shrubs and some of the dogwoods, they're multi-stemmed. So, you know, you may not always, uh, you know how to know that, the plant that you're looking for. Here's a, a publication from Virginia Tech. You can look at the whole beautiful publication on this. What not to do, ways to kill a tree. Uh, don't top it, like don't murder a crate myrtle um, by cutting off all the top branches. Um, having co-dominant, again, leaders can, can make a tree split. We don't advise uh, painting pruning cuts. We tell you how to make a proper pruning cut. Broken branches can be an entryway for insects and diseases to get in. Uh, um, attaching things to the trunk like birdhouses with a nail or, you know, other decorations is not a good idea. Poor planting and excessive mulching. So we're going to talk about a few of these. So this is how to plant a tree. And you're going to dig a wide hole, two to three times the, as wide as the root ball, okay? Because trees don't grow down, their roots grow out, um, and they want to grow out wide. So you're going to give it lots of space. And when, when I dig a wide hole, I also loosen the sides of that hole so that you don't end up with a slick surface um, that the roots can't penetrate. Only backfill the holes with uh, regular soil from your yard. Don't, don't put organic matter or peat moss or compost in the hole because that creates what's called a perched water table. I know that lots of you probably do this, but make the hole just native soil. Um, if the soil is super compacted, then you're gonna have to just loosen it in a wider area. Or you can 
apply compost to a, a large planting bed with many shrubs in it, as long as you're not putting it in the hole or around a specific tree. It creates an environment that the roots won't go beyond. They'll stay in that nice amended soil in the hole and they won't venture out further and you'll get a perched water table which will cause, could cause root rot. So this is typically what we see when we buy a plant. I've had lots of um, discussions with uh, landscapers about, no, we're gonna leave, they wanna leave the burlap and the wires on. Well, that burlap does not break down. There are some other wrappings that break down a little bit better than burlap, but, and trees are heavy and it, it's hard to get all the burlap and the wires off but it is worth your effort. Look how constricted that first picture is. So you're gonna, and look at the circling roots in the, the second picture. Uh, those need to be cut and prepared so that they, they, they go out like a wheel in the wide planting hole that you have prepared. Uh, here's a picture of cutting off the bottom of, of a shrub where all the uh, roots have congregated and this is before you put it in the last picture is before you put it in the hole You're going to spread the roots out in the hole so that it has room to grow out There is a YouTube on tree planting for a, a Ilex glabra on our YouTube channel and you can take a look at that It's it's still pictures with a script But you can if you have any questions about this again, you could google uh, how to plant a tree.edu or how to plant a tree.ext, or you can call our extension horticulture help desk for advice. Mulching, we see a lot of bad mulching going on. Um, the, the picture on the right uh, is wrong <laughs> mulching. It's piled up against the tree trunk. And see that flare at the bottom? Uh, that should not be covered with anything um, because that encourages disease, and that's a very sensitive area around that root flare. So no mulch against the tree trunk. You can see the root flare zone should be free of mulch, and the goal is mulching to the drip line only about two to four inches deep. And my trees and shrubs are not mulched to the drip line, but if they're in the woods, the leaves are doing that. And in my, pro in my open areas, I, I am working toward mulching to the drip line because I know that's best for the tree for a number of reasons. If you don't mulch properly and if you allow turf grass right, right up to the tree roots, the turf is gonna win. Tree roots cannot compete with the number of roots in turf grass. There are some chemical disadvantages to turf being up close to the tree roots also. Again, don't, don't mulch deeply, two to four inches, Thick mulch, gets, it gets compacted over time and it prevents rain and irrigation from getting in. It, too much mulch can cause less oxygen, more, um, more decay of the trunk. This is vole damage in this picture. You can see that um, the, the voles had a lot of really great cover to hide under and then when they got to the tree, they chewed around the perimeter of the tree. Too much mulch uh, keeps the soil too wet uh, and root rot can develop. Again, and, and rodents can chew the bark and, and girdle trees and shrubs. So irrigation is another thing we get a lot of questions about, but mostly this is the way we get the questions. People come in and they say, I don't know what happened to my tree. And we say, we ask several questions. How is it mulched? Let's see how it's planted. Um, and we're not there to judge, we're there to help correct problems. Uh, and we usually say, well, and how much is it irrigated? And some people say, well, I don't water it because it rains, the rain is what irrigates it. And if you look back in the last, you know, seven to 10 years, we've had a lot of droughty um, seasons and um, our rainfall just has not been sufficient. And there are specific diseases that attack a plant that is drought stressed, and we see those increasingly. Uh, so plants need irrigation if they don't get sufficient rains fall. So newly planted trees need even more taken care of. Uh, they need consistent watering until the root, roots establish, and the roots can, can take a couple years to establish. 
uh, particularly if they've been in a, you know, a pot and the roots are restricted and, and, and they may not have been spread out in the hole correctly uh, or planted correctly. Um, of course, we're, you're going to plant it correctly. And after, after the planting, the roots are going to grow and establish until they're much wider again than that, that above ground portion. So here's a good rule of thumb. Sprinkling is not a good idea. Sprinklers are not a good idea. Hand watering deeply. I watch trees during the heat of summer. I try not to plant anything right now from now until it gets a little cooler in the fall. You gotta watch new trees and see if they need water daily, new trees and shrubs. And again, you're, you're not sprinkling, you're watering deeply. And I'm not saying you have to water every day but you should check the soil to see if it's moist and those, those roots need to be uh, kind of babied at the beginning. And after three to 12 weeks, you can water it every two to three days as long as the ground isn't frozen. After 12 weeks, water weekly if the rainfall is insufficient. And rainfall needs to be a good soaking rainfall, a good deep one inch a week at least. But, and again, roots can take about one to two years to establish depending on the tree and the size. Some trees like wet, wet areas more. About one to five gallons per inch of caliper, and that's the area around the tree at six to 12 inches above the ground, the diameter. As the roots grow and spread, it'll need more irrigation. This is our general rule. All plants and people wilt in the hot afternoon. That's common, that's normal. But if it's wilting in the morning, that's a sign that it was not able to take in enough moisture the day before or during the nighttime. So um, check the soil with your finger to see if it's wet in the root zone. Hand watering is always preferred, but you know, there are extraordinary situations and gator bags can be helpful, but they can also do harm too. This is a gator bag that's on a tree and, and I see they've mulched correctly. The gator bag looks like it's full of water. Most gator bags are empty. <laughs> a lot of, you know, the, because the water gets used up and somebody forgets to fill them again. And actually that gator bag forms a really moist, dark environment and, and um, it's, it can lead to decay. So you, you gotta be really careful that you use, if you use a gator bag uh, because of the situation is, dictates it. You can't get there, you're on vacation. Uh, landscapers need it and um, go back to check periodically, but it releases a slow trickle over five to nine hours with about 15 gallons of water. Remember this picture. It's an old, old picture, but it's better than any of the other ones I could find. A well-established tree doesn't just go down, okay? It extends four to five times the diameter of the drip line. So a young tree, pretty much the roots are in that hole that you dug. But as, as the tree gets older and more mature, you know, a deeply soaking uh, watering in the root zone is important. Remember, tree and turf can't coexist. The turf's gonna win. Don't need to be fertilized when you plant them, if it's a healthy tree. You should only fertilize based on symptoms and then verified by a soil test. And we can get you soil tests by mailing them to you from our office or at, when the libraries reopen, you can um, pick them up there. If you have a disease problem or an insect problem, you can consult a licensed arborist for, for diagnostics. Then they will come on site and take a look at your tree for a fee and pick somebody who's qualified by going to treesaregood.org. That's the International Society of Arboriculture. And you can put your zip code in and look for a licensed arborist. But you can also send photos. Uh, samples can be brought to the Extension Horticulture Help Desk. This is by appointment only at this time. Uh, or you can send photos of your tree to Master Gardener at pwcgov.org. And we will do our best uh, to, to give you some recommendations. And if we need a sample to be sent, uh, to the Virginia Tech Lab, we will make an appointment for you to come in and bring that in. Choose natives, meet the cultural needs, get the right plant, plant it right, mulch it right, and you're going to have fewer problems and your investment is going to last. So let's look at some pictures now. Here's Cerasus canadensis. I know you're familiar with this. 
it exhibits cauliflower where you see the blooms that are right on the trunk and the bark, really interesting, heart-shaped leaves. It likes the edge of a forest. So when you're driving down the road in the spring, April, May time period, you see, you see uh, these on the edge of the, the forest sticking out toward the road. And so watch where trees naturally appear. And those are the, those are the spots that you wanna put those in, in your uh, yard. The leaves are thin and they're used by leaf cutter bees. Uh, the flowers are certainly a nectar source. Fringe tree, Hyananthus virginicus, a beautiful tree, fragrant. Um, not very tolerant of drought, so it needs some, you know, special attention, likes full sun. Um, it's in the family of ash trees, so there has been some evidence that it's been attacked by invasive exotic emerald ash borers, um, but it also is affected by native borers sometimes. But generally, it's a pretty trouble-free tree, about 15 to 25 feet tall. Service berry is a great tree. Um, this Amelanchier canadensis is the one that's the Northern Virginia native. The other is more toward mountain regions. So if you live on Bull Run Mountain, that might be something to consider. Delicious berries, if you ever get any. <laughs> the, the birds and the deer really do like them too. But um, I saw somebody on our Facebook page had uh, gotten a whole bowl full and I, I've never gotten that many. Um, lovely fall color delicious fruit, full sun part shade. It does get rust on the leaves and the fruit sometimes. Uh, some bright orange pustules that uh, develop with an alternate ho host tree. If you put it a certain distance away from the other hosts, then keep that from occurring. Sweet Bay Magnolia um, is a beautiful, fragrant, uh, small tree. It prefers medium to wet soils. I found it very slow growing, but it get, can get up to 35 feet, so that's a little over our small tree limit. Uh, pawpaw, great, delicious fruit. Northern Virginia natives prefers full to part sun. It likes moist sites. I, I see it growing, you know, streamside. Uh, when, I, when I kayak, I, I'll see it along the rivers, uh, along paths in the woods. Uh, sticking out on the edges. Um, again, the fruit is delicious. The flower is very interesting and available for early pollinators, about 15 to 25 feet, feet tall. Silky dogwood, you know, we know our Virginia dogwood, but there are, a lot, there are several other native dogwoods that really are worth a second look. This is a silky dogwood, about five to eight feet tall, so we're getting a little smaller now. It's best in the full sun, but look at that fall color and that, that spring white flowers dark green foliage and those blueberries that birds like. Uh, really nice uh, native tree, but small. Here's our uh, native uh, Cornus Florida. And this one in the picture is planted in full sun. And again, just think about where you see this growing in nature. It does better in part sun with rich humusy soils. When it has, when it's in full sun, it tends to get uh, drought and disease stress more often. We see them in a lot of landscapes, right in the middle of the front yard. But really, it does a little bit, it does better and it's less stressed in a part sun condition. Songbirds like the berries, so do, so do small mammals. Here's gray dogwood. Another, what, uh, I, have both, I have both these two dogwoods in my yard, the gray and the um, silky. The flowers are lovely and fragrant. And when the flowers drop off, you have these red stems. Uh, and then the white berries occur uh, toward the fall for uh, birds. It's a little bit more than eight feet tall uh, and part to full sun. American holly, now this, this is not your typical small tree when you think of small trees. In natural areas, it can get to 50 feet tall, but really in suburban landscapes, it's usually about 15 to 30 feet. Likes full sun to part shade. Um, it will grow in shade, but it tends to have fewer branches, fewer leaves. The leaves tend to be a little bit bigger, and it tends to be a little bit stressed uh, in, if it doesn't have enough sun. It does need well-drained soils and male and female uh, plants to, um, for the berries to develop. Now, you might wonder why I put this one in. This is a Northern Virginia native. It looks like our, the invasive Atlantis to me, but it's a good alternative to Atlantis. Look at those white flowers at the top. 
Um, it is deer resistant. Can you see why? <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty lethal. It likes the forest edge. Every time I've seen it growing naturally, it's been like along a trail on the edge. It doesn't grow in deep shade. And this is a very interesting thing. This is why teaching is such a wonderful thing. You always learn something that you didn't know before. It's spiny when it's young. So deer don't eat it because they don't like the prickers. And actually those are modified leaves and they're really treacherous. But as it grows, it loses that prickliness. So when it's young and weak, it's got that defense. And when it gets older and more mature and can stand up to the pressure, uh, it doesn't have as many of the prickles. <laughs> Fascinating. So this is not really a small tree either, but it's manageable and it's, it's a great tree for wildlife. So Linda Goulden, I think it was a good idea to put this one in. It can get up to 65 feet tall in ideal conditions. This might be a good, your property down below where you don't have as, you know, as you can use it as a screening tree. Uh, it's much better, I think, than a Leland actually. And the, the berries are, are great for deer. Uh, deer nibble on, not for deer, for birds. Deer nibble on it, but they generally don't like how prickly it is. And so they, they only do a little nibbling on the new growth. People, everybody calls it Eastern red cedar, but really it's a juniper. So let's look at some shrubs here. Um, they can be a variety of sizes. They can go from ground cover size to near tree size. And again, some of them are single uh, stemmed and some of them are multi-stemmed. And these will give you a lot of great choices as far as seasonal interest. Here's spice bush. And you know, the best thing about spice bush is that it's deer resistant. It has very fragrant leaves. I think it would make a great cologne if anybody wants to market that. It has beautiful red berries that birds like. Um, I think our forests of the future are gonna have a lot of spice bush in it because the deer don't like it. Look at the flowers, they come on, um, they appear on bare stems, um, branches, um, and has nice yellow fall color. Look at that caterpillar. This is the spice bush swallowtail. Is that the cutest caterpillar you've ever seen with those eye spots to scare away birds? And um, there's the adult version. And um, I think it's a great tree. I, I think this could possibly be one of my favorites. Atia virginica, a sweet spire, is fragrant. It likes medium to wet soil. So I've tried to grow it and I didn't give it enough water. And so it didn't do as well there. About three to five feet tall. I mean, that's a perfect suburban shrub. And there are some shorter cultivars. It takes full sun to part shade. Look at that fall color too. It's absolutely gorgeous. So we're doing a, working on a landscape plan for a historic property in Manassas City at Liberia Plantation. And instead of boxwood hedges, which are not native, we, we chose some sweet spire. And um, it's going to be astoundingly beautiful when it gets installed. Summer sweet or clethora. Again, this is similar, likes a similar place to the Atiyah. Uh, medium to wet soils, full sun to part shade, very fragrant, um, but don't let it get droughty. You know, you take good care of this, make sure it gets enough irrigation. Look at those flowers too. Bees and butterflies just love it. Red twig dogwood or red osier dogwood, cornicericea, likes full sun to part shade. Uh, it's a fast grower, but you can cut it all the way back down to the ground if you need to, and it will, it will pop back up. And to keep the stems red, you take uh, the new growth is red, the old growth is brown, so you can just selectively prune to the ground or any of the brown stems to keep it red looking in the winter. It does have a, you know, it, it's known for its winter interest, but I think the flowers are just lovely too. Father Gilla, a very underused plant, likes, uh, likes acidic soil. Uh, there's Father Gilla um, major and Father, Father Gilla gardenia. And that's the dwarf version. It's fragrant. Look at those bottle brush type of flowers. Likes full sun to part shade. Great fall color. I, I think it's one of the best shrubs for fall color. This is one I have several places in my yard. Um, Amorpha fruticosa or false indigo. One of my volunteers reviewed my presentation and she noticed that uh, Baptisia, remember we said that sub shrub that I mentioned the first part of the presentation was uh, false blue indigo, and that's a sub shrub, but this is called 
uh, Morpha fruticosa, false indigo is the common name. You can see why common names can get you in trouble. It's a good native substitute for invasive butterfly bush. We would recommend not planting butterfly bush because it doesn't provide a host plant for all seasons for, for a caterpillar uh, butterfly to use. It just provides some nectar. This provides everything. Uh, it's visited by a lot of different pollinators, bees and wa uh, beneficial wasps, butterflies. And it's about four to 12 feet tall. It likes the full sun. It likes to, to be well watered. And it says on a lot of websites that it's fragrant, but I think it has a very odd smell. But look at those flowers, they're purple. And then the stamens that are sticking out are bright orange. Very interesting tree. Buttonbush likes wet areas. It draws a wide variety of pollinators and uh, beneficial insects, birds. Uh, full sun to parch does like wet areas and it likes alkaline soil. You know, I'm thinking uh, floodplain, alluvial kind of areas. Now, alder, uh, I see this mostly on stream banks or uh, alongside a river. Uh, when we do, we've done some site visits along the Occoquan and the stream bank erosion is occurring or around Lake Montclair. And you, you can see all, you can see that alders would work really well on, on those areas to hold stream banks or, or uh, the banks of a lake. Look at the, co the cones, which is actually the, and, the, and there's the male catkins in the top uh, right. It's a nice shrub and it, you can see it hanging over. Uh, it does require that moist soil, so that's why it likes that uh, floodplain riverbed, river edge. This is our native rose. Uh, instead of knockout roses, this is one you can plant. It's not as readily found, but native plant vendors uh, will have it. You can go to the Plant Nova Natives website and there's a list of commercial vendors that sell native plants there in case you're looking for them. And there are some reputable online sources too. This will grow in partial shade, but it, as any rose, it flowers better and it's more disease resistant in full sun. It's low growing, it suckers. It can be kind of aggressive, so you wanna give it a lot of earth, a lot of territory. So it might not be suitable for your smaller uh, suburban townhouse areas. Uh, it needs some area to spread. This is beautyberry. <clears throat> the berries uh, congregate on the on the stems, um, and they persist all winter long, so that birds can eat them. They're usually in my yard. They're not the first choice for the berries. The berries uh, persist most of the winter, and by the end of the winter, they're gone. This is the native beautyberry. Uh, there is one that's more commercially available. That's non-native. It's it's from Asia, Calycarpa dicotoma. I think I'm saying that right, but remember Latin, you don't have to say right because it's not a spoken language, but it's dicot, toma. And so I would prefer this one. I, I, uh, I have found that the Asian um, beauty berry reseeds all over my yard and I, this one is less aggressive. New Jersey tea is one I've recently put into my yard, put about three or four of these in. Look at the, the beautiful flower, it's fragrant, it tolerates drought once you establish it, it tolerates being under a black walnut tree. It's really a compact shrub. This is great for a townhouse or a suburban lot, three to four feet tall, blooms in the spring. Look at that fall color and really great for bees and butterflies. Nine bark, you don't hear, this is an underused shrub too. It does like acidic soil. It's in the rosaceae family which makes it have some diseases and insect issues. Generally, um, it, it's a sturdy shrub. Physocarpus means bladder fruit, and that refers to the, the fruit of the plant after the, the flowers fade. Nine bark refills, uh, refers to the bark peeling, so it's nice for winter interest if you like peeling bark. Full sun to part shade. This is the native St. John wort. There's a lot of other St. John's worts out of here. This is out there, but this is the Northern Virginia native. It's deer and rabbit resistant. It's a host plant for caterpillars. It's attractive to bees. Look at that. I just think those flowers are gorgeous. You can use them as cut flowers. You can prune it in the early spring to keep its mounding shape. It likes full to partial sun, about one to five feet tall. It's deciduous, so it loses its leaves. 
Look at this one, hearts are bursting. American strawberry bush, you, this, is, this is the only euonymus that I, um, that I think would be worthy of consideration. A lot of the other euonymus are um, exotics and they have a host of problems that we see on a daily basis in our, in our um, profession. Uh, that this is, look at the fruit and the flower of this. It likes full sun, but I found it growing naturally in more partial sun, woody, wooded slope areas. Um, it's got red to orange fall, um, fall foliage. Unfortunately, deer like it. So you may need to use a little deer deterrent with it or put it in a protected area. But I think it would be worth it to have that color. I mean, I, I remember the first time I saw this in the woods, I was just shocked that it was native. It is just so showy. It is poisonous to sheep and cattle. Not that probably many of you have to deal with that because uh, of glycosides. Steeple bush is not a plant I'm familiar with, but I have some friends that can vouch for it. It's about two to four feet tall, which strikes me as a very, very good plant for a small suburban lot. Uh, it's deer resistant. It needs moist to wet soils, but full sun. And that it's, there are a lot of spireas out here, but this is the native spirea tomatosa and spirea meaning in Greek wreath and a, as the um, shape of the flowers. This is our native hydrangea. It's deer, deer and rabbit resistant for the most part, although I have seen some nibbles on mine. Uh, it tolerates black walnut toxicity in the, or allelopathy in the soil about three to five feet tall. It blooms on new wood, so that means you can prune it back all the way in the very early spring, late summer. It likes part shade, a Northern Virginia native. This is the oak leaf hydrangea. This is not native to Northern Virginia, but it's a native to the southeastern United States, not specifically to Virginia. A good fall color. We have this at our teaching garden, and we have some fencing around it because deer do nibble on this one. Uh, six to eight feet tall, really pretty showy blooms. Winterberry holly, you need male and female for this. Look at the flowers on that. And that the branch, it's a deciduous holly, so it loses its leaves in the winter, leaving bare branches with bright red berries. You gotta have one, one male, and that will be enough if you have six to 10 female um, plants. So sometimes nurseries don't know if it's a male or female, but if you go to, you know, a reputable nursery, they can usually uh, point you in the right direction. I have one male and eight females in my yard, and uh, uh, the male's name is a cultivar called Apollo, which I thought was very fitting, and uh, he does a really good job keeping berries on all the other females. This is Ilex glabra or inkberry holly. This is a good substitute for non-native boxwoods because it's deer and rabbit resistant, prefers acidic soil, heart shade to full sun. And you need a male and a female to produce the berries, about five to eight feet tall. This is your pond holly. And to me, that doesn't sound like a native plant, but it's native to the East Coast, uh, Ilex vomitoria, not a very nice name, but I think that refers to don't eat the berries. Uh, you can see it can be pruned uh, to look more like a tree uh, or it can be pruned to look like a shrub. Um, you need a male and female. It can tolerate a, ho a whole lot of different soils. We're actually, actually putting some of these at smaller cultivars at that historic property also. I think I already covered buttonbush, so this is a repeat, but since it's such a great plant, let's just look at it again. I mean, is that pretty? Like, really likes wet spots, and hummingbirds love it. Chokeberry, aronia. Apparently, the berries are high in, high in uh, good stuff. I can't remember. I can't think of the right word. Um, it suckers a lot because it's in the rosaceae family. The berries are dark black. I had two, and one was getting so full of berries that it was leaning over and I couldn't get my car under it. So I took a chance and pruned it way back. And now it's a nice uh, compact shrub again and um, on its way to producing a lot more berries. It has really pretty fall color, the kind of red, yellow, and orange all together on the leaves. Red chokeberry is its kind of its cousin and it, it's similar habit to the black. 
chokeberry, but it gets a little taller, five to 10 feet tall. It can handle wet areas. Again, it's in the rosaceae family, so it suckers a lot like anything in that family does. Oh, it's a Northern Virginia, both of these are Northern Virginia natives. There are a lot of viburnums out there and some are native and some are non-native. So if you wanna stick with natives, I'm gonna show you some pictures of those. This is the maple leaf viburnum. These, this is the possum haw and the black haw and the wither rod I'm not familiar with, but um, that's listed as a native Virginia, not uh, native to Northern Virginia. The black haw and possum haw are both native to Northern Virginia. They all take full sun to part shade and they're varied heights. So if you want a viburnum and you want a native, then you look at all the, I, I use a, a lot of sites that are, I'll put viburnum.edu and that gets me to a site um, that, that will give me consistent information on height, moisture, full sun, part sun, whatever uh, cultural information that I need. Here's some more viburnum species. These are not native to Northern Virginia. Look at the berries on both of those, <clears throat> really favored by songbirds. Nannyberry is a great shrub. It, uh, this is a very mature size. Um, it, it, they are a little bit slow growing, but pretty flower, white flowers in the spring. Northern bayberry is one that I think has been underused in our landscape. And I was um, chatting with our county arbors yesterday about this to see what uh, she, she thought about this. And um, there's a Northern and Southern bayberry. And I really wasn't sure which, we're kind of on the cusp of both of those. And so she recommends the Northern bayberry. She thought the form was better and, and she's had um, success with it in reforestation projects in um, Prince William County. It's fragrant. It smells like bayberry candles. It's evergreen. The berries attract a lot of different birds. And when they digest the seeds, the wax is removed in their digestive system and the seeds are able to regerminate, which is fascinating. It's a larval host plant for banded hair streak and red banded hair streak butterflies, the polyphemus moth, and um, is tolerant of wet sites, dry sites also. It's semi-evergreen. It eventually does lose its leaves. It's tolerant of salt um, if, you, if you have a roadside issue. And I, I just think, I think it's an interesting shrub. It has the red stems, the white berries, the green leaves. And this is at a county facility in uh, Minnesota, which I th thought was a, a really creative way to use, use it. I think it's an underused and really should be considered more often. Elderberry. Elderberry is kind of a large shrub. So as far as it, it's, bigger than eight foot tall and it's wide it has a multi multi-stem shrub tolerant of wet sites also walnut allelopathy uh, it attracts birds and pollinators look at the berries there's a lot written about using elderberries for health reasons it's self-pollinating um, but it can benefit from cross-pollination if you get if you have two different cultivars of a of a elderberry you might you might get more berry production so the low bush blueberry is not as common uh, in Northern, Northern Virginia as it probably should be. It's deciduous. It has pink flowers. It tends to like uh, part to full sun, six inches to 12 feet tall, two, two feet tall, sorry. I, I'm, I keep thinking about the high bush. So here's the high bush. And those flowers are in the middle are from my yard. And uh, the berries, of course, uh, feed you and the birds. And I think it's an underused shrub in suburban uh, lots because <clears throat> it can produce food, but it also um, looks like an ornamental. Look at the fall color of that. I, I can't think of a more vibrant shrub with great fall color like that, except for burning bush, which is invasive. Uh, and this would be a much better alternative and you get berries too. Pinkster azaria is a native uh, azaria. Look at those flowers. Um, three to six feet tall. It likes full sun to part shade. Uh, attracts a wide variety of birds and butterflies and pollinators. It's des deciduous azaria. It, this was a very good year for this. Um, I, we, I had a bunch of requests wanting to identify it. People saw it peeking out from a wooded area. And so I think this is an underused shrub too and, and would be better than planting a non-native area. 
witch hazel blooms October through December. What could be better? Um, when everything's dark and gray, you're, you've got uh, these really interesting strappy blooms and it, it's an early nectar source for pollinators that also attracts birds. Mountain laurel, of course, that's a little difficult to grow in this area unless you have perfect conditions. It needs moist, cool, humusy areas. Here's some uh, credits for some of the photos that I have in here, uh, and you can <clears throat> review those later. Check out our other presentations on YouTube. You can just Google VCE Prince William YouTube. And here's our upcoming classes. And now I think we're ready to take some questions that um, you can share with me. Uh, one question we have is uh, someone's looking to replace their Leland Cypress border trees. And let's see, they're looking to replace the Cypress. What's something good to replace that's about the same height, but doesn't get as wide, I guess? I yeah, the Leland's are, the problems that we see with Leland's are generally due to diseases caused by drought and, and lack of irrigation. <clears throat> and when the when Leland's touch each other and get wider and wider, they transfer that disease to each other. So poor planting, poor irrigation, and too close together is the, are the three problems we see with Leland's. So I would need to know more about the site and how wet it is. Is it full sun? You know, is it level or is it on a slope? Um, and how tall you would want it. So. I would email the answers to those questions to our Extension Horticulture Help Desk, and we can see if we can um, match you up with a, with a screening tree, um, probably not a small tree. Uh, it looks like you'd want a screener, screening tree that would be suitable for your conditions. Uh, what small trees grow in the shady yard with bigger maple, sweet gum, and red cedar? I would suggest any of those understory trees that like sh shade. Um, for example, this, uh, this mountain laurel, uh, if you had the right conditions, if you had humusy soil, you're gonna have to deal with competition from those uh, larger trees though. So maybe some pictures of the area and you take a look at how moist it stays, how easy it is to irrigate, and how much, how many hours of sun it actually gets. Which hazel might work? Uh, this pinkster azaria might work depending on the soil conditions. So do a little detective work on what the, what the area actually looks like and how much competition is there. And you can send us a question with those answers. Okay, what do you think of the alternative, or the alternate leaf dogwood? Yeah, I. I just planted one of those. I, I don't really have an opinion yet. I would look at Morton Arboretum is a really good site to take a look at um, what, what conditions that would grow best. Uh, that's not right on the tip of my tongue, but I would Google that with Morton Arboretum at the end uh, and you can take a look and see. I've heard good things about it. I don't have any firsthand experience with it and I just planted one. Okay, someone's looking to replace their burning bush in a full sun with light shade or full sun to light shade with well-drained sandy loam. They're looking for something that's about four feet in diameter when it's mature. How about this? That high bush blueberry might be a good choice. Uh, it's, a good, it's good color. Let me see if there's what else here. Four feet wide, they say? Yeah. I think a high bush is, a, is, is really a good choice. Yeah. Is it, it's full sun and not wet, probably. I, I, this uh, Ilex glabra, it's not going to have the color, um, but that, that's a possibility, too. And you could get a smaller cultivar for that. Looking to plant a lot of things in the next few years. Um, should they be planted all at once or in succession, or does it matter? Um, I would suggest you, you plant in the fall. Generally, fall is more forgiving, not always. But you're gonna have to irrigate until the ground is frozen. So, you know, how much can you handle physically? I know I, know I probably overdid it this spring, planting too many new things, and I'm having to irrigate a lot more, and it's time consuming. So count the cost to yourself, 
And um, plant in the fall when it's more forgiving. Make sure you're irrigating till the ground is frozen. You know, we can help you with plant selection if you have a specific site that you're not sure what to put in. Okay, uh, how do you get rid of invasive shrubs in woodlands? Ba uh, barberry, euonymus, honeysuckle, rose? Be persistent. <laughs> we have a presentation on uh, the YouTube channel on dealing with invasives, and then there's a second one about replacing invasives with natives. You might want to review those. There are some chemical recommendations we can give you for each specific plant. So you could send an email with the list of invasives that you have. If you're not sure what, what they are, you can take pictures of them and have us identify them. And then we can give you an actual management technique for specific to each one, emailing Master Gardener at pwcgov.org. Uh, I'm hoping to propagate some bushes that I already have. Fall is best for planting. When should I start the cuttings? Well, you can do a, you can do some cuttings in the fall. I would pick, pick a day that there's been enough precipitation so they're not. Softwood cuttings probably in the spring would be better. Hardwood cuttings you can do while they're dormant in the winter. Uh, I wouldn't probably do late fall would be okay too. So if you Google taking a, taking a, hard, a softwood cutting or taking a hardwood cutting .edu, or .ext, you'll find some um, good instructions on that. If you have any questions and you're not sure, uh, you can also email us. Um, some, some are easier than others. Some just, you could put a brick on and, and, they're, and they're, they're layering themselves and you can pull the roots up and reroot it. What do you think of lilacs? Well, in our area, we have hot and humid weather. And lilacs are, I mean, I love the smell of lilacs, but they don't do very well here. They always get powdery mildew just because of our climate. And it's not a native, so I would pick something like that indigo, um, false indigo bush instead, not as fragrant. Or I would pick some, one of the flowering viburnums. That would be a better choice. Um, lilacs just have too many disease issues. Uh, there's a comment that they have high bush blueberries and they can be very leggy and that sometimes that happens if there's not enough sun. Also, like any other shrub, they do need to be pruned from time to time. So that's something to keep in mind if you're thinking about high bush blueberries. Yeah, I usually do some dormant pruning just to make it look, look a little more like an ornamental. The other thing with high bush blueberries is that they usually only produce for three each new cane only produces for about three years and so if you, you have to be judicious about what you're pruning otherwise you're going to prune out all of your uh, fruiting wood right so right. do you use root tone for softwood cuttings i usually do yeah there, there are a number of products you can use that are rooting hormones i mean do you have any suggestions for foundation plantings yeah a lot of these um what you want to look at is the mature size. So, uh, and how tall you, you know, how tall your windows are. Do you want it to cover your windows or not cover your windows? If you, you know, we can start, you can look back through this presentation and see if there are any that would fit that bill. I would probably stay away from Ilexes um, or the polys unless you get a small cultivar and, and keep it away from the foundation. Some of the viburnums might fit the bill. Clethera. Uh, would be a nice foundation plant. It sort of depends on your conditions in the site. Great. We hope to see you at our next free classes uh, next Wednesday, growing small fruits in your garden. Hope to, hope to see you then. Thank you, everybody. Have a good week. Enjoy your fourth. If you enjoyed this video, let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. For more information on lawns and gardens, contact the Extension Horticulture Help Desk. Thank you for watching.